Welcome back to We Talk Money. We were off, I think, for just a week, but we've got the having tomorrow. We're recording this on Thursday, April 18th. We are in the middle of earnings season. We've got a lot of macro stuff to talk about. Guys, what's happening out there in the, the market world? You forgot to mention the market's in turmoil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it seems like, in, at least in crypto, we went from euphoria to complete panic overnight. And I actually tweeted this today because I was so annoyed with Twitter. My God, man, people are so damn emotional. I said, crypto Twitter in a nutshell. When prices are going up, we're all singing kumbaya and saying, my brothers, let's dance in a circle and celebrate our love for the new paradigm. And when prices are going down, you are my sworn enemy, you ignoramus charlatan. I can't, I cast a spell upon thy family for a hundred generations. Like I swear, this is the the mentality of a lot of people on on the interwebs, how emotional they are and how emotional they respond to price. Are you guys seeing that in FinTwit and on the stock side too, or not as bad? Not quite as bad yet, but we're only down like, I don't know, 4% right. on the S&P. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> uh, but even with that, you have people, you know, making really ridiculous claims and, you know, the, the Doomer bears are out again, you know, uh, running victory laps over a 4% correction, but we get excited for markets melting down. I know that sounds kind of sick, <laughs> but you know the reality is for anyone that's like under the age of like 60 or 65 years old, you actually want to root for the markets to pull back so you can buy stuff for cheap. You know, that's Absolutely. what we get excited about. So, yeah, we're hoping that this dip goes further and if it does, yeah, I'm looking forward to watching some people lose their minds on Twitter and elsewhere. I mean, and look at this. So this was something else I, I sent out because it was like the other day, people are, it just felt like people are losing their minds. And I had to post this monthly chart on Bitcoin because we had for the first time ever in Bitcoin's history, we had seven green months in a row. And I said, you know, anybody who's surprised by April pulling back and for anybody in the wealth building community, I, I said, I think this is the highest probability as we have a red April because we went so far so fast. And I said, back test what happens after Bitcoin goes up seven months in a row. And then I just got a bunch of smart ass replies. Like <laughs> people are like, oh, a, a, a sample size of one. Another way to say this is like, what happens when Bitcoin is green for six months or more in a row? You know, the, the point here is like, we expect a pullback. And the fact that everybody's just freaking out is like, I don't know, man. It, it's frustrating. It's annoying. But I guess that's why we do the show. That's why we do content to help people realize that you don't have to lose your mind when prices pull back. <laughs> well said. I thought, I thought though that like crypto people had the guts of steel and like could deal with these corrections and it was like child's play to them. That's what I thought. But there, am there I is a segment that there is a segment of smart people, but it's like, the second that market sentiment shifts, so many people just get toxic and bitchy and like, uh, I, I don't know. It, it's annoying. It's annoying. I'm over it. I want to move on. <laughs> ah, <laughs> how are you spicy. feeling about, how are you feeling about this having that's basically what, 24 hours away? Yeah, man. We're, uh, we're actually, let's see or as less. of recording. Yeah. We're just over a day away. Yeah. So this is looking pretty fun. I don't know. This is look, the having event itself is probably not a big deal as far as like price is concerned or, you know, it's not like fireworks are going to start popping off, but it's just, it's another, it's another middle finger to the haters because this is another four year cycle, not really a market cycle, but a four year having cycle that has gone by without any issues. And Bitcoin continues to thrive. It's the honey badger of money. And it just keeps shaking off all the problems that get thrown at it. We're watching the the crypto miners on the stock side. There's been some interesting action there. They have definitely been down pretty significantly in sympathy with Bitcoin and other crypto assets over the past couple of weeks. But what we're noticing in the last 48 hours or so is that the crypto miners are actually rallying quite a bit more than Bitcoin, which is a little bit surprising. You know, I, I figured that we'd see the underperformance leading up to the halving. And we we might not get the crypto miners coming back to life until Bitcoin hit all time highs again. But I'm surprised we're seeing strength in the miners right now. I don't know if they're going to lead Bitcoin. That seems like it would be a pretty unusual precedent. 
but I can't ignore the price action there. I think it's maybe telling us something that the market may be actually looking to get bullish again, at least in corners of corners of that market. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they've definitely, a lot of these have gotten massive washouts and you know, like some of them obviously are, are performing better than others, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of blood over the past couple of weeks and miners were absolutely a part of that. And so it is good to see the, the bounce kind of with Bitcoin, right? So if we, if we take a look at Bitcoin's price today, you can see that we are still inside of this big consolidation zone that I've been talking about for the last month or so. And we hit support. And as of today, we're getting a bounce. And then you can see the having is going to be tomorrow's candle. So we'll see where things end up. But so far, I mean, this is just, in my opinion, a pullback in a much larger trend. What do you guys think? Oh, yeah, I think that um actually just recorded a video on this for my YouTube talking through the Bitcoin and the S&P 500 corrections right now. And, you know, this Bitcoin correction is really still not much in the grand scheme of things. And same thing with uh, the S&P. We're only down. I think we were down four and a half percent, you know, near the lows. And um it's just nothing it, 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 in the grand scheme of the moves that we've seen Bitcoin the run it had from the lows of 2022, you know, the S&P similarly running over the past year, a uh, year and a half from the lows. And um, these are some pretty big moves that need pretty, pretty significant corrections to be able to sustain the bull trend. So I don't think people should be upset about this. I think they should be happy about it. Uh, I think dip buying opportunities will be abound, you know, as we see how this plays out. Um, and I just, I think that this is good for the overall bull trend in both of those assets, in my opinion. Yeah. I think you wrote about this last week, right? In the daily dough, um, talking about the, the trend line of doom and how doom. I think even in the last we talked money, you were saying, you know, you're expecting what a five or a 10% pullback in the indices. And it looks like on the snap of this support, that's what we're getting. And we've got the moving averages that are still pretty far down. So yeah, yeah, I mean, it looks to me like price could still pull back deeper and still be in a bull market. Exactly. And that's the point that we need to make here and drive that home is that even if we see a 10% correction in the S&P 500, we are still, you know, in an overall, it's not breaking the bull trend. And the same thing with Bitcoin, Bitcoin could pull back much further and we still have these nice, you know, healthy bull runs corrections and you know hopefully another you know run after the market cools off a little bit um as we know you know we, you can't expect things to go up forever it's just never going to happen that way we're always going to have to have these periods of taking a breather and cooling not cooling off and i think people you know should see that specifically in this current market environment as an opportunity um because i do think that the bull the bullish uh price action is still technically intact and it will be for the coming future. Um, we don't necessarily uh, think too much is going to change with the economy, you know, at least too drastically anytime soon yet. The labor market's still holding up. So yeah, I, I just don't expect us to go into bear, bear market price action anytime soon. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit more about that, like on the macro side and with rates, um, Trav, I think, you know, people are worried that inflation might be coming back and, you know, it looks like the Fed might not be cutting that much. What's the, have you had any changes in your thesis on that or what, 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 what are you forecasting for the rest of the year? Yeah. So I think it's worth pointing out that rates are a concern here. You know, the, the path in U.S. government bond yields over the past few weeks, really since the start of the year, is, is a bit concerning for, for asset markets, for, you know, risk assets. So I don't think the overall picture has really changed that dramatically. But on the margins, we've had these like slightly hotter than expected CPI reports over the last two months. And there's some categories within. If you dive into the CPI and look at actually what's driving it, you know, there's some wonky stuff. There's like car insurance rates up 20% year over year. Transportation is increasingly adding to the CPI over the past couple of months. That's a category that's been very, very hot. 
We've talked about services inflation in areas outside of shelter. Uh, Non-shelter services have also been rising at, at a pretty decent clip, over 4% year over year. So those are areas that are a little bit sticky and concerning. Um, on the flip side, I still think we have this story of the shelter, the lagged shelter component of the CPI, the largest component of the CPI, is still coming down slowly over time. And we're going to get some relief on CPI just naturally because of that. That will continue through the summer months. And so I I think it will be interesting to watch how people will react if we start to flatline around 3.3, 3.2 maybe in CPI. What is the market going to think at that point? Because right now, you know, the market's starting to get really, really concerned about rates and it's starting to worry about does the Fed need to actually hike? Forget cuts for now. Does the Fed need to hike? I think that's a little premature. Uh, I think we still need to give it some time. One month of CPI doesn't really make a trend. So I still think that everything looks pretty good overall. Like Nikki said, the economy looks solid, but it's not like it's not going crazy gangbusters. We're just not seeing like a ma massive rise in unemployment or anything like that. So things look like they're still in pretty sound footing economically. You know, energy prices are up a little bit in the last few weeks on geopolitical tensions. That has some people worried about reflation, but you know, overall, even though we've had these hotter than expected CPIs, I just don't think it's really that big of a cause for concern. Um, what is concerning, like I said, is is the the path in rates, you know, does have a real effect. It has an effect on borrowing, you know, mortgage rates now back above 7% on the 30 year. So that will have a cooling effect on the economy. So I think, you know, we're going to see probably some impact from it. And we could see this correction go deeper because of that. But ultimately, I don't think the overall macro story has really changed that much. Fair well enough. Yeah. Yeah. Nick, and, anything to add on the macro side? Well, I wrote in the Daily Doe uh, when I wrote about inflation the other day, you know, I specifically put in that chart of the, the rents. So if you scroll down, well, I also was mentioning the same thing Trav just said, how, you know, one month doesn't make a trend and we've, it's not going to be a straight line down, you know, from 9% inflation down to two. We're going to have those blips in the road um, and the data might be lumpy here and there, but essentially, you know, the shelter component, if you scroll back up, you can see the rent were declining in the back half of 2023. And so that still has to kind of funnel into CPI um, going forward. So uh, I think that could end up being maybe a, a tailwind for uh, CPI to kind of come back, tick back down and, and get back under control. We'll have to see if, how the other components, you know, m work with that, <laughs> work against that or with that, like oil, for example, and like Trav said, transportation has been a little bit of a pain in the butt, but um, yeah, no, that's it. Cool. So we got a bunch of questions this week about, or I guess related to inflation. So Isaac was asking the Fed signaling fewer rate cuts this year. What does that mean for the overall market? Like stronger dollar? Is it bad for real estate, crypto? Do you guys have any opinions on how this is going to affect markets specifically? Yeah, I mean, Isaac kind of nailed some of the bigger uh, price impacts we've already seen. You know, the dollar tends to go up when we have U.S. rates settling at a higher higher level, especially versus other countries. You know, the ECB's come out and said that they're not really going to follow the U.S. in terms of the path of interest rates going forward. So what we could see is, for instance, the ECB and the U.K. and other countries cutting rates faster than the U.S. And that could lead to a stronger dollar because all, th all else equal, the dollar will be stronger if investors are looking to invest in U.S. assets that are yielding more. So, yeah, you could look at strong, stronger dollar. You could, you know, make the case for lower stock prices and lower real estate prices with higher rates. We certainly saw that effect play out in 2022. Um, so that is certainly an impact I think we could see in the short run. That's why I think this correction could go deeper over the next probably one to two months. But again, overall, you know, I just don't really see, I don't see cracks in the economy yet that would suggest that we're going to see some other major shift outside of like the obvious stuff that we're seeing just in the near term in asset prices. Um, I mean, I guess it's a wait and see, uh, you know, so, yeah. until we, until we get data that tells us otherwise, I think we're, we're in the same environment we've been in basically since like the fall of last year, or maybe even the summer of last year. Yeah. And the, the other thing that people have been thinking about and another question we got was how will oil prices affect stuff? Um, and I know we mentioned this briefly, but I guess one of the big, big looming, uh, not really a black swan, but just a potential negative on the, the market is the, you know, Iran situation. And there was the attack over the weekend and that 
kind of fizzled out. At least it seems like pretty quickly, but like, I don't know. Do you guys forecast much higher oil prices or do you think we're going to stay in kind of this choppy range? Cause if, if you look over the past like several years, yeah, we had a kind of a, a pop in late 2022. Um, but then, you know, oil prices have actually been flat inside of this channel in between like 65 and 95 bucks for the past couple of years. Um, any ideas on where this could head and any impacts from oil? Yeah, you saw the the big spike up in 2022 with the Russia Ukraine situation initially, and then of course now we have the Israel and Iran situation. So those geopolitical events definitely have the potential to create you know those those really rapid spikes in prices. But generally, once you have the the world kind of understand like the conflict, as long as it doesn't become you know full out like nuclear war, World War Three situation, the market will kind of digest the the true risks of it and eventually shift back to okay, what's the actual supply dynamics on the ground? of crude oil. And that's what we have here. You know, now it looks like the market's finally kind of settling back down into to pricing crude oil based not on geopolitical risk premium so much, but more back to what does the supply demand situation look like? And we have seen a little bit more demand growth this year, I think, than the market expected relative to what we had at the beginning of the year. At the beginning of the year, it looked like we might actually have a little excess surplus, surplus in crude oil. Now, you know, OPEC plus has been pulling back and actually you know, not not producing above quota and things like that. So there's been a little bit better supply response. And then you've had a little bit stronger demand from an improving global economy. So the supply demand balances have gotten a lot tighter. And that is why you've seen crude rise above 80. I, I can't really predict what happens with Israel, Iran. So if that really goes into next level escalation, we could have 100 plus crude prices in a in a hurry. But uh, absent that, I think, you know, crude probably is at a pretty good level right now. Oil, oil and gas producers are producing pretty decent returns, but not like outsized returns. So I think it's actually at a pretty good level if it can stick around 80, 85 bucks a barrel. I think it would be good for everybody, good for mm -hmm. the producers, good for the economy, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and uh, good for us if we all avoid World War III. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we do, but um, if that happens, none of this really matters anyway. So yeah, um, we're going we're gonna to just move forward as if that's not going to happen. And uh, what you would think is happening is World War III in the crypto markets. And Nikki, you were uh, I saw you were tweeting here. Um, the 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 fire guy was saying Bitcoin's under sixty k. Haven't heard much from the crypto bros in a couple of weeks. <laughs> then, well, now you've got me questioning my response on this from earlier when you were heated about the crypto bros on <laughs> Twitter being crazy over a pullback. But you know my my. I don't know. I just think it's silly that everyone's got to be taking shots at crypto or Bitcoin investors. Like anytime price pulls back, it's like shots fire, you know, yeah. which, every which way. And it's like, why can't we just accept how markets work, that markets run and markets pull back? And, you know, the odds are that most people in crypto, if they wanted to buy at 70,000, they're probably loving this this correction that they're going to get an opportunity to buy into. Um, but maybe that's a smaller percentage of the population than I thought that would be being calm and used to. Maybe it's just the people in our wealth building community. I was, yeah, that are, that are I was going to say that there, cool, there's a very big difference between the traders in our wealth building community and the general vibe on crypto Twitter. Those are two completely different different mindsets. And yeah, if you look in our discord over the past week, people have been in there buying blood, buying dips, you know, position sizing, thinking rationally. Um, there was even one of our members that did a poll in discord and you can see the mass majority of people are like happy on the pullback, but you go on crypto Twitter, a lot of those people are like counter indicators. They're, they're on the opposite side of our trades. So yeah, you're right. I mean, there's probably a portion of crypto people that are patiently buying and doing things like that. But if you were just like an alien and you plopped into the crypto Twitter, you know, degeneracy, you would think that, you know, World War Three was happening in crypto. So yeah. I guess I'm used to being in the community where, you know, everyone's kind of got that better, healthier mindset. Um, around crypto pullbacks and they're just used to it like it, this like i said earlier that's child's play this correction's yeah. child's play for them also but. fire guy over there probably like has never like had the courage to invest in anything outside like voo or something i mean this guy <laughs> probably this guy's missed the best performing asset of the last decade he's probably yeah. you know he doesn't realize that like 
95% of all crypto or Bitcoin wallets are in profit still. And like, you know, I, I don't know. This guy is just exactly these, these, these guy guys. I'm so sick of seeing them on Twitter. I'm so sick <laughs> oh, of them. Man. Getting, There's like, a guy for everything now. Oh my, it's just, it makes me want to puke. Like it, it's just so overdone. And like most of them don't even bring any value at this point. You know, there were a couple of them, like the car dealership guy who I actually think provided good, valuable info, insider info from the industry. But everyone else is just a copycat that producing just garbage takes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and, and here's the thing, like the the crypto or let, let, let's not even say crypto, just the Bitcoin haters, period. Their cope is during bull markets, Bitcoin's a bubble. When Bit, when prices pull back, oh, Bitcoin's dead, haha, ha, taking shots, right? So it doesn't matter what price is doing, they're always going to take shots. They're either going to be salty when it's up or feel righteous and liberated when it's down. You You can't help some of these people. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Man, this is the 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 mentality yeah. or the vibe on this show is pretty aggressive. <laughs> I, I don't I know. It. Maybe maybe people will like that. I don't know. Oh man, no, I'm just Everyone loves bullshit, a little man. drama. So sometimes on Twitter, I'm like, man, this is or X, whatever we're calling it now. I'm like, oh man, this really is like the best social platform. And then the next week, I'm like, this is garbage. What am I even doing on here? It, it, <laughs> I don't know, Trav. How do you feel about that? Uh, yeah, that's my take exactly. I mean, like some days I just have to like close the app. I'm like, I'm just like, it's I'm so just bad. Like, oh my god, I can't do it today. I'm like, I can't. I just can't today. <laughs> it's it's bad, guys. It. I don't know what is going on, but the algorithm has been effed because yeah. it's just all all the takes out there are just terrible or generic or not helpful. It's just a mess. I noticed something interesting. I don't know if you, if you saw this at all, Chris, but uh, you know, over the past week, there's been this whole um, movement of all these tweet threads about GCR. Like, I guess this, this pretty famous crypto trader and investor uh, who in the last cycle or maybe over the last couple of cycles turned like a small stake into like, I think hundreds of millions, if not like a billion plus, according to to some people. Mm -hmm. And so this this GCR account, and I guess he has a new account that he's tweeting under. For some reason, literally every time I log on to Twitter in the last week, I've seen a different thread about GCR. GCR this, oh, this is why, you know, this is how GCR taught me to trade meme coins. This is the takeaway from, you know, what I think investors should be copycatting GCR from, or like GCR, let me tell you the story about GCR. I'm like, how many people are going to do threads about GCR? Like, okay, the guy's great. Let's move on. Like, I don't know. I've seen more GCR threads than I've seen threads about Buffett or Druckenmiller at this point. You know, what's strange is like post, um, dumb money. What was the guy's name? The kitty guy. Um, Oh, oh yeah. Uh, Keith, uh, Keith, Roaring Gale. Kitty? Keith Gale, Roaring Kitty. Yeah. 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 It's like, there's something weird in the trader community where everybody's trying to find their next God. Like who is the guy or the lady or whatever, or the anonymous person that has done something extraordinary and who we can follow and worship. Right. And there's nothing wrong with like learning from people, but like, you know, this, this whole worship mentality, no matter if it's Buffett with the, the VOO fire, conservative guys or the, you know, GCR, you know, de crypto degenerates or anything in between, people are always looking for something to like hang on to or like figure out like, oh, what did they do? And how can I like mimic that? So I think that's where that desire comes from. And I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that. I mean, it's good for, you know, I don't know, eyeballs and like social media, but if you try to blindly mimic what somebody else has done, you're going to lose money. Like think about all the people that we saw that after there was the big short squeeze on GME, they thought that there was going to be another short squeeze. They didn't realize that the hedge funds were already squeezed, that the liquidity event happened or that the, you know, the squeeze happened. People just thought that there was going to be another opportunity just like that in the same ticker. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we see that time and time again. Maybe this is just another one of those. Well, people yeah. also think that history is always going to repeat itself in stocks. You know, like a lot of people probably buying a lot of different things that just with that one saying like, oh, well, it went up before. It's got to go back up again. You know, Tesla might be one that people are doing that with right now. 100 so percent. You they're it, buying you. it. Yeah, they're buying it because they're like, oh, well, it went to 400 a share before. It's going to do it again or whatever the high of it was. I can't remember. Um, 
So I think that that's just naturally everyone looking for that quick get, you know, get rich quick type of move. Yeah. And that's what gets people in a lot of trouble, especially like looking at Tesla right now. Um, everyone's going to look at that prior run that it had. Uh, what year was that? In 2020, maybe? Yeah, 2020, 2020 and 21. Yeah. Yeah. And they're going to look at that and they're going to look at the chart and they're going to say, well, it did it before. So it's got to do it again. It's Tesla. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's just so much more that goes into making an investing decision than, than that. And that's how people get wrecked. Yeah, I mean, the chart has shifted in, absolutely into a bear market. I mean, you can see the 100 period moving crossover went below the 200 period recently. We were making lower lows, lower highs. So this is really, I mean, we had the the dip in um, January of 2023. But since then, I mean, this is the weakest that that stock is looking. And I mean, there's a lot of downside potential in Tesla. I don't know. Um, isn't this still the the biggest underperformer in the S&P or something like that? Yep. Yep, the worst performer in the S&P year to date. And, you know, that that I think has a lot of people salivating and looking to buy the dip, but I do think this could be a sub $100 stock at some point this year. I agree. Uh, the, fundamentally, Tesla is in a very, very tough place right now. Um, obviously- What's going on? Well, I mean, we're going to get- we're going to get their first quarter earnings here. Um, and I think, I think they're next week. I'll have to double check that date, but you know, they already reported deliveries for Q1 that were way below expectations. In fact, they shrank year over year. So for a growth company that was trading for 60 plus times earnings, even higher, actually earlier at the start of the year. Um, and now you're shrinking that, that to me, you know, just says that there's still a lot of potential downside. I mean, you've got them lowering prices. You've got some potential demand issues in countries like China. Um, and you know, some concerns over what's going on with their next gen model. And so, yeah, there's a lot of things you could point to as option values for Tesla, future potential, huge markets like the humanoid robots and the, the self-driving cars, you know, auto, um, robo taxis, uh, robo taxis. Thank you. So those are not contributing to, fin to the financial results right now. That's the problem. Yep. So in the short run, it looks really bad. I think the earnings report is going to be pretty ugly and they can try to spin these future, you know, bullish markets as the the future and the addressable market that you know really is why tesla should deserve a higher than average valuation but there's no reason it can't go much much lower in the short run because of the actual financial results that are happening right now so that's the concern um i do think it becomes an interesting buy the dip opportunity at some point uh but it just fundamentally right now, you don't have a whole lot in the near term for 2024 numbers to really be able to, to, to get behind that stock yet. Yeah. I think that this is an interesting topic, right? Because just like Tesla got overhyped and overvalued, how could it get over like the market sentiment, get over negative and undervalued? Like yes. where does that happen? Even if you are like a long-term Tesla bull, like, where do you get into that juicy territory? Do you guys have a price zone that you're looking at? Or is it still something where you need earnings to be a guide of like what truly is undervalued? I have, I have targets that most people probably, most Tesla bulls would, would think are laughable. Um, but those targets are at like 25 times 2024 earnings. <laughs> so, uh, that's significantly lower than here. You know, that's another probably 30 to 40% lower than here. So, uh, will it get there? Probably not. Like usually with these types of stocks, like I never quite get to the the place that, um, you know, I think they should get, but yeah, I mean, you could easily see this thing even at 25 or 30 times this year's earnings, that's still trading at a pretty hefty premium to the, the auto sector. And I do think Chris, you made a good point, which is that at some point, this stock price does cross over into the territory of undervalued on a longer term basis, undervalued on, you know, the potential five and 10 year out numbers. But a lot of times what happens is when sentiment and price action shifts against a stock, then investors start to overly focus on the shorter term numbers and they forget about the long term bull thesis. And so that's yep. really, I think, what could happen. And that actually would be a great outcome for investors who've been looking to get into Tesla more aggressively is if the market starts to really discount the future opportunities and just look at, you know, just value Tesla on the present numbers. So I would love to see that personally. I don't know if we'll quite get there, but that would be great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely one to watch. I mean, for sure. Um, like, added to a shopping list at a minimum and just keep an eye on it. You know, us, you know, value people that like to get a good deal. Um, that's what we're doing. Uh, but definitely worth a watch. Yeah. I mean, cri crypto, I would say is kind of in a similar 
holding pattern right now where there's been big washouts. So um, if we take a look at total three, which this is the non Bitcoin and ETH market cap, you can see over the past week, there is a, a pretty decent washout, um, but we're still in a bull market. I mean, technically this is like the, the first pullback that we've had since January. It's the first meaningful pullback. And it's, it's wild how that happens, right? Be it Tesla or Bitcoin or altcoins or, you know, any other kind of volatile asset, like how fast market sentiment can shift. And it, it just goes back to the lesson of like why trading is so hard because it, it requires you to do things that are uncomfortable. Right. And I actually sent this out on the Twizzler the other day, I said, there's only two types of people in the markets. There's those who consistently buy euphoria and panic sell, and those who consistently buy blood and sell euphoria, right? It sounds obvious, but most humans will always be in the wrong camp. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I think about Tesla or, you know, the, the crypto markets, it's like when everybody's losing their minds, when everybody is you know, panic selling and, and you're getting, you know, stop runs, and liquidations and, you know, things like that. That is literally the time to step in and say, okay, where, where does this get stupid? Right. Where does this really just become juicy? And I have some trading strategies that I've built for trading view on the crypto side, but like stocks are also really great at finding those opportunities. And if you develop that skill, you can apply it both in crypto stocks or even in business in certain ways. So I say all that to ask the question, are there any other stocks or areas of the market that you guys see that happening or that you feel like are really juicy right now or maybe even getting close to being in that kind of territory or are things still just really expensive and, and maybe overbought? We, yeah, Nikki and I both have actually been talking about this in the community. We put together our shopping list for this current correction and we've got a couple stocks already hitting fresh lows or fresh year to date lows that, you know, could be interesting. We talked about some in the daily dough, like Starbucks. Uh, I know Nikki's been tracking Lululemon after its post earnings sell off and it's starting to get to more reasonably valued levels. And so those, those stocks for sure are in focus. We've got the ones on our shopping list, which, you know, if you're part of the community, you can, you can see what we're, what we're kind of licking our chops for, but there are pockets of value. I think there are already pockets of value. I think it could get much more broad. Uh, we've only just now in the past two weeks started to see the number of stocks going below like their their 20 day moving averages their 50 day moving averages we've only started to see those numbers really start to rise on a broad basis so we're still on the front end of an overall market dip but certainly there's already some values starting to emerge i will say also we have seen pretty negative price action from a lot of the companies that are reporting earnings so far we are now in q1 earnings reporting season and so last week we saw JP Morgan with decent numbers, but the stock sold off 6% on Friday after they reported because investors were looking for stronger guidance. We saw TSM today, TSMC, the big semiconductor company, again, guiding to strong growth next quarter, but I guess investors wanted more. So the stock is down 5%. We've seen a number of examples. In fact, when I ran the numbers on last week's earnings reporters, we had one of the worst median returns of, of uh, companies reporting earnings that I've seen in about a year. Oh, so wow. if that if that continues, now we are still very early at the front end of the earnings reporting season, but if that continues, that likely means that we'll see more negative reactions to earnings than positive ones. And that will give us way more opportunities for individual stock buys and stock dips potentially. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, as we look at the, uh, the S and P right now, I mean, this is still selling off into the afternoon session. That makes one, two, three, this would be like the fifth red day in a row. And it seems to me like if we just run some simple like TA on this, We've got the 100 period moving average that's getting closer. We've got some Fibonacci retracement zones. So yeah, I don't know. If I was in the stock side, which I know you guys are full time every day, uh, this is where I would start to get like kind of excited just from a, a TA basis, right? Um, yeah. I know like over the past like quarter, we've been in this upside kind of grinding trend. But now that we've started to see this kind of more aggressive pullback, that's where I think at least on like a swing trading type basis, you can find a lot more opportunity. I think the 4,800 level on the S and P is not, you know, out of the realm of possibility, like pretty soon, you know, in the next week or two, um, we'll have to see, but the way this trend is going, you know, 
I think people are waking up, investors are waking up to the higher for longer narrative too. Um, and so, yeah, I think that we could continue to see this pullback have some legs, which I think is a good thing. I'm, I'm excited about it. <laughs> I, we've needed it. I mean, we've needed it so, so badly in my yeah. opinion. Um, we, we had another question um, that says, uh, if the economy is so gangbusters and nothing is stopping us from mooning, why cut rates at all? Right. I, I think that's the the argument there. And they said uh, every time further increases in rates is brought up, bulls complain that even a 25 point increase will blow up the economy. So which is it booming or fragile? I mean, that's, that's a, a great question. It's a, it's a, it's very <laughs> on point. Yeah. I applaud whoever wrote on the that. nose using their, yeah. using their noggin. Yeah, no, I mean, they're totally right. I think the, yeah, I mean that, that kind of gets at the heart of, of what we've been dealing with the push and pull over the past year. I do think, you know, I, I said this a while back, but I do think a lot of this is self-correcting. So if we get, we get higher yields and then all of a sudden we do start to see weakening of the economy, particularly in areas that are rate sensitive, like real estate or consumer, consumer lending and places like that, that naturally cools the economy and starts to help the inflation problem. So it, it's nice that we have kind of this self-reinforcing loop and, and that pushes us back into the Goldilocks zone of the soft landing, perhaps. I mean, that that's the, the positive scenario. Um, the negative scenario that I can't take off the table is that, you know, the Fed waits too long. They make the another classic mistake in waiting too long to actually utilize monetary policy in the right way. You know, we know that they shouldn't have been buying mortgage bonds and keeping yields at zero when things were ripping in 2021. And on the flip side, you know, if we do get a weakening economy and, you know, they keep rates at too high of a level for too long, then they could actually push things into a situation where unemployment rises a lot more rapidly. So uh, hopefully we avoid that. Again, the push and pull has worked so far over the past year. It doesn't look like anything's cracking or breaking massively yet. So I'm still pretty cautiously optimistic, but yeah, I don't think, I, I don't think the economy breaks if we, you know, if we stay at these rates for six months longer. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think it's good for us to be up at 5.25 or five and a half. If the CPI is just still at three or three and a half. I mean, I don't think we need to freak out too much over, you know, 3.4 versus 3.2. It's not that big of a difference. You know, we don't need to be hiking rates yet. Yep. Well said. Well, okay, let's let's wrap this up. I've actually got to teach a crypto class to our community in a few minutes. So um, one more thing I wanted to point out and kind of talking about like what I'm looking for in the next week is the fact that Bitcoin dominance is still trekking higher. Um, and what this means is that alts, altcoins on average are underperforming Bitcoin still. And we saw that really start to accelerate on the recent washout, it was like Bitcoin pulled back, but alts pulled back a lot more. And you can see we are now at the highest level of Bitcoin dominance since early 2021, which is where the last bull market started. So the question right now is like, are we going into some kind of new paradigm, right? Where Bitcoin is just going to eat alts lunches and we're going to get back up above like 60%. Um, or do we get rejected here from 55% and see an alt season in the second half of the year? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but that's the thing that I'm looking at probably the most closely right now. Um, as I've said over the last couple of years, I've been heavily biased as far as my position sizes towards Bitcoin. And I have a few alt positions, but for the most part, I've been riding the, the Bitcoin bull trend as my largest position. And that's why, I mean, you can see the only reason again to hold alts is if they have alpha over Bitcoin. And this just kind of proves that most do not. So I trade in and out of them, but Bitcoin has still been kind of the hero since the lows of 2023. So that's one thing I'm looking at. Again, we've got the halving coming tomorrow, which is Friday. And yeah, we'll see what happens. I, I don't expect any fireworks as far as price goes, but uh, it's something to pay attention to. We're definitely at some pullback support zones on crypto in general right now. But yeah, that's really what I'm looking at. Um, so kicking it to you guys, is there anything on the macro or the stock side that people should be thinking about or looking out for over the next week? 
Earnings season, baby. We're going to keep watching what happens with uh, the actual earnings reports, but also the reactions to the earnings reports. Like we talked about so far, they've been negative. Will that shift or will that just intensify? And that will be basically top of mind for us. And we'll be digging through reports like like mad men and women <laughs> over the next <laughs> couple of weeks. It's 10K was... time, baby. <laughs> All right. Cool. Yeah. And, and then on the, on the chart side, I mean, you can just kind of zoom out and look at the NQ or the ES. Look at the the major indices and see if we get a bounce at these support levels. Nick, is there anything else you're looking at? I mean, I'm watching this price action in the S and P um, by the day. I mean, especially we're seeing this weakness going into what time is it? Yeah, close, get, getting close to the end of the day. So um, we're breaking in a lot of key support levels in multiple, you know, stocks like Tesla's breaking a key support level. The S and P, you know, broke down. There's a lot of there's a lot of room below here. So we I'll be watching the technicals pretty closely and following up again with with earnings and how those those stocks are responding from a technical perspective as well. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, stay dialed in, everybody. Stay disciplined. Don't engage in the toxicity that is uh, Twitter. <laughs> if you can avoid it. And uh, yeah, I mean, the next couple of days will be pretty big. I'll probably be on some live streams over the next day or two. So we'll see you guys in the community. Go to wetalkmoney.com forward slash community if you're not in there with us. And yeah, what else? Any final thoughts before we wrap it up? Um, Stay safe out there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't get know. On, get on stay the right safe. side of the market. Yeah, people like, that like, are panic buyers, not panic get in, sellers. Get in the mindset of being, you know, the dip buyer and not the person who freaks out and doesn't know what to do, right? Amen. And on that note, we're, we're there. We're there. Yeah. On that note, we'll wrap it up. Travis, Nikki, thanks for being here. Thank you guys for watching. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Leave us a review on your favorite podcasting platform. See you guys next week. Cheers. See ya.